Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today is gonna to be one of those in-depth opinion kind of videos. If you don't wanna hear my say on this, uh, you're more than welcome to skip over just a normal video. Uh, I wanna start doing more in-depth opinion videos about certain topics that come or arise in the film industry uh, from either users, uh, companies, and stuff like that. This is gonna be one of them. So uh, negative supply, okay, the company that makes that little uh, negative supply 35 millimeter uh, film holder, which I made a video overview uh, that I posted a couple of days ago. I'm gonna post it up here or down below uh, under the like button, there'll be a link to it. Uh, has made this device that is to help you digitize your negatives, positives, 35 millimeter film basically, with a digital camera and a couple other things that you need. So first of all, the biggest amount of comments I've been getting either on my video or on other pl places is all about the price. So I wanna start off by that. So that's the biggest topic. The price of the device is around $279 at the very moment and uh, with the pro stand, it's like $400 or something like that. And basically, I think that yes, it's not a cheap device, but at the same time, the thing that they're creating is uh, gonna be there because there's a niche for it. Okay, inside film photography, which is already a niche inside photography, uh, we have uh, people that wanna scan their own stuff, which is also a niche because a lot of people send it to the lab or some people don't even scan, just go straight to the darkroom, all of that. And there's people that scan and a lot of people are scanning with Epson scanners, a lot of people are scanning you know, with uh, cool scan scanners, cool scan from Nikon scanners and other devices. And they came out with a little device that will help you scan uh, with a digital camera. So you take a picture basically and create a digital file of your film, then you can invert it or not depending on what film you're um, digitizing. So the price is kind of hefty, but at the same time you have to think, the Kickstarter became uh, came live like I think July 1st and they raised all the money they needed. I think they did 300 plus of what they wanted. And the thing is, they made a device to cover a niche and they made a device that they wanna keep on making. So the thing with Kickstarters and products and film photography is maybe they could have made it cheaper and but then they wouldn't probably have any wages for themselves, which people kind of have to live off something. So you can't just make a device and not make any money. Uh, they have to pay you know, their bills and their stuff and materials. Of course, the materials cost is way less, but you wanna check something like that, grab your smartphone and check how much the materials in your smartphone cost. But you're paying sometimes two or three times that because someone has to get paid to make it and you know, live off that. So that's one of the things. And then they're also using that money to invest in making new products because Negative Supply is a company which they've created thanks to this Kickstarter. They came out with a product that was already in the pipeline to being produced. So it wasn't a Kickstarter that they made and raised a ton of money and then they take three years and then the product is a piece of S. And you know, the usual story, we've heard that before and other Kickstarters in the film industry. They didn't raise a whole lot of money. So they're making this device, they're already shipping it and it's today is almost October 1st and it's been basically a couple months and they're already delivering it and they've made it out of metal. So they're making some out of metal, which at the same cost, which demonstrates that they're absorbing the higher quality you know, product and costs of making it and you as a final user getting you know, a better device. They've improved a lot of the things that I saw in the video. They actually told me, I can't tell you exactly step by step. I hopefully will get one of those metal, uh, you know, properly working models because mine was a beta uh, testing product. Yes, it was working, but you know, they've improved stuff. And then it's Mark One. So 35, yes, it doesn't do 120, but they're making it 120. They're making a four by five one. So negative supply is gonna keep on supplying us, pun intended, with products to digitize and help the film user. And that is part of what you're paying in that price. So yes, everyone can 3D print some sort of solution. Some people can make it uh, out of you know scraps of old and larger parts and scanner. Someone told me that's basically like the same uh, thing as the Nikon, I think it's MA20, like the holder for the Nikon CoolScan 5000 and stuff. And yeah, it, it might be true, but this is a new product that you can buy in the market you can put in your house with a light table and a you know reproduction stand and a camera and you can digitize uh, your film, which is already a small niche, like we said. 
So how many users are going to be buying this is also a big matter in the price. And before everyone, you know, is getting all rowdy is tell me when was the last time that you were going to spend $300 and it wasn't on camera gear. Yeah, film sometimes is expensive and paper is expensive, but everyone's happily available, you know, going to purchase a camera. And a lot of people throw $500 or $1,000 for Hasselblad without hesitating. Nobody's saying it's expensive, but a $300 device that helps you scan and get those results on your digital workflow so you can share on social media, you can print it on a printer, you can make a book of blur or blurb, or you can make a zine or whatever it is, is expensive. So I'm one of those that thinks it's a little overpriced for what I can afford, but I don't think it's expensive, expensive as a device, considering that they're gonna be making more, they're gonna be making new, and they're gonna be investing in time and design. So that, at the end of the day, what's the cost of that? And I'm gonna make another reflection that I think is very interesting is all the film shooters out there will agree the film is not cheap. And if it was up to them, film would cost 50 cents or 80 cents or a full dollar less than it is. But the thing is, do you think that money you're paying for the role is just, you know, is just gelatin, you know, and just a little bit of emotion and why not? They've been doing it for, you know, hundreds almost of years, um, at, least, at least a couple, de you know, decades. So why can't they just Bring the price down. First, there's less people, just like the device. There's it's a niche inside a niche inside a niche. Uh, second, think costs go up. Third, if they made it for less, they would close, like a lot of people did. Polaroid closed their doors. Agfa closed their doors. FK closed their doors. Ferrania closed their doors. There's so many film factories that could not absorb the digital stage, and the, but the ones that are existing now are going to have to push the price up because they're just basically covering the costs. They need to invest in new machinery. They need to invest in new labor. And this goes with the video that I, that I recorded at uh, the Finnish Helsinki Film Fair with Adox and Mirko, where he was saying film has to go up at least the 10, 15, 20% for those companies to be able to reinvest. So at the end of the day, we all would want to pay less, but at the end of the day, why don't you do it yourself? Like if you think, that the negative supply is too expensive, which is not cheap, it's not a cheap product, but can you make it cheaper and can you make it you know, easily? Can you make a Kickstarter, raise a ton of money and then deliver a product just as fast as they did? If you can't, I mean, maybe you should consider giving them credit on like, oh, you made something that is obviously a need for a lot of people. Hamish Gill had his Pixelator and he's had a ton of problems and issues, but not all his own fault but a lot of things happening. And the device was cheap. I think it was like 40 pounds uh, UK. And that thing is awesome because it can do multi-formats and it can do four by five and it can do 120 and you know six by seven or six by eight, six by nine, 35 X-band, all these things. But at the same time, it's still not available because he'd been working so hard to make it. Maybe if he charged a little bit more, he would have been had a little bit more wiggle room. I'm sure if you ask Hamish, and this is not a question directly to you, Hamish, like, it has he run out of money to basically make this product of all the iterations and all the changes and molds and stuff? He probably is there on the limit. And that happened to the people from Ferrania. I mean, not Ferrania, sorry. The people from Ars Imago with the lab box, they basically almost ran out of money and they raised 700,000 euros for basically a modern day Rondinax. And there's been issues with it too. I've used the, the beta testing of this device, the negative supply, and it worked really well. So at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say in this opinion is we have to look at what we're, you know, doing. And someone left a comment too, which I appreciate, Hogarth. And he said, like, we're all saying film is not dead, but then any product that comes up, it's too expensive. Oh man, that's too expensive. You know, I could do it for less or I could do, but nobody's really doing it for less. So that's a solution. And if you look at the negative supply device, there's a couple other people doing it apart from Hamish Gill, which still isn't in the market. We have um, the film toaster, which is really expensive if you compare it in price. Then there's a device that I saw, I think is in Thailand, which is cheap, it's $100, $190, but it doesn't have the same advance. There's the digit digitizer or digitize a uh, little mask from Lomography, but every time you have to change the roll, you have to open it, you know, pull the roll out and dust and scratches can happen. We're talking about a device that will let your film go through it without touching anything, just the sides, you know, where the sprockets are that it keeps it flat 
and I won't say 100% flat, but it keeps it really flat considering there's no, you know, surface like glass or anti-Newton, you know, glass or anything there, you know, to make it flat, uh, that it will be scalable in the system. So it'll be part of an ecosystem. So there's the Mark 1 in 35, there's going to be a 120 and a 4x5. And I don't know how the solutions are going to be, but I'm really interested. And that's why I haven't purchased it yet, because I really want to see what the family of products will be with negative supply. So yeah, I just want to make you guys think, and I know there's a lot of negative comments and there's a lot of people criticizing and some people are interested because that's why they got backed. But like, we should all think about, yeah, film is alive, but we should back these products, you know? Uh, we should back it with our money, at least interest and show genuine interest and say, that's interesting, maybe overpriced for me, but it's interesting. You know, Lomography came out with a metronomy, uh, metron Metropolis film and it got backed, and it's a film that I would never purchase, but you know, it's pretty cool they're making it. Maybe they make these weird, funky films, they'll make one day a, uh, you know, saturated film, and maybe we'll get something like we had, you know, the Ultra Color or the Vivid Color from Kodak, from Lomography, but if we all just look at it and say, ugh, that's horrible, I would never invest, too expensive, maybe they'll never make it. So we gotta kinda think about that and, you know, in general terms, and I, I'm the first one that having a YouTube channel, I try to transmit the most honest review possible in the product and I did it. And I said, you know, this thing has flaws, it has pros and cons, and it isn't cheap. It's cheap in the terms of the whole setup. But honestly, if I had today to scan, I don't know, 15, 20 rolls a month, and I wanted something consistent and good for color, black and white and slide, I think the negative supply is probably the best device out there. And really fast and yeah you can't use small strips and it's a bummer but like if you're doing your new film and yesterday I developed I think it was seven rolls I'm going to put them in my frontier which is a scanner that's in a lab and all around the world and it's getting old it's aging so and it will take forever long and it doesn't have digital ice because mine's the SP 2500 and it crops in which the negative supply doesn't and there's many things. And you can go at your lab and ask them, what scanner are you guys using? How is the software running? I bet you they'll tell you it's old and they're, they're crossing their fingers for, for it not to break. Same thing if you update your Nikon CoolScan software and you get the new Windows or the latest Mac software, it won't start working because it's happened to me. It's happening to a lot of people. Yeah, we have ViewScan, but you know, how much longer will it work? So this new solution gives you kind of a stable future because you change your body, a digital camera, it doesn't have to be the latest and greatest. Of course, it'd be better if it is, but I really like the idea. So I'm just making this video. Negative Supply didn't tell me to make it. It is totally my own opinion. Uh, I've thought a lot about it throughout the days of using it and before and seeing the comments and all that. So I very much appreciate it. If you leave a comment, you can say, you know, you go, you know screw you, I don't agree. It's fine with me. We can all not agree. But I think it's good to think about these things and put a different perspective. And I'm going to be trying to interview uh, AJ and Saxon from Negative Supply for, you know, a bit more in depth of the pricing and what's the because and, you know, what. Because I really want to ask those questions and get real answers from them, not just me speculating. But if you have any questions you want to ask them, let me know. Leave a comment below and uh, I'll catch you in the next one. If you're looking at this weird device, I'm making a new set here. So I wanted to practice how it would look. I hope you guys enjoy this video and see you in the next one.